Welcome back to Heroes of the Faith, a show where we are inspired by the lives of the saints so that we can become saints ourselves. I'm your host, Isaac Longworth, and today I want to tell you about one of my favorite saints who actually shares my name. His name is Saint Isaac Jogues, and I love this guy, not just because he shares my name, which I thought was pretty cool, even from the time I was a kid, uh, but because he is a true example of what it looks like to be a courageous hero for Jesus. Like you'll hear about it in his life. This guy was willing to go anywhere it took. He was willing to suffer any danger, any pain, any discomfort to see God glorified. He never turned back from things that were tough, but he pushed through, he endured for the sake of God. And I just think he is so inspiring. And I hope that you're inspired by him just like I am. Well, St. Isaac was born in the year 1607. He was born in France, and he was the fifth of nine children. Now, growing up until around the age of 10, he was homeschooled by his parents until he was sent to a Jesuit school, a school run by Jesuit priests. So the Jesuits were founded by St. Ignatius Loyola, who I've done a show on in the past, and they were famous for going to the most dangerous places in the world to share about Jesus with people. And so Isaac was being taught by these priests back in France, and he was really impressed by them. He was impressed by their stories. And while he was in school, he was able to hear God's call on his life to imitate them and to become a priest. And so when he was 17 years old, he joined a Jesuit seminary. He studied with them, learned from them. And when he was 29 years old, he was ordained to be a priest. And soon after he was ordained, Father Isaac met with several other Jesuit missionary priests, his brothers, who had just returned from New France. So New France was the name of what is currently known as Canada, my home country. You see, the French explorers had landed there. They had started a colony called New France, and that's where the Jesuit priests had traveled to minister, to serve not only the French colonists, but also to reach out to the native indigenous tribes that had lived in Canada for thousands of years before the Europeans had arrived. And so these priests told Father Isaac about the adventures that they had gone through, about the wild and dangerous forests and wilderness of Canada, about the freezing cold winters where there often wasn't a whole lot of food to go around. And they told him about the dangerous but rewarding mission work they were doing amongst the indigenous tribes. And all of these stories excited Father Isaac, and he wanted to go and be a missionary in Canada as well. But his fellow priests warned him, look, Father Isaac, this isn't a pleasure cruise. This isn't a vacation. Going to Canada as a missionary is going to be hard work. In the summer, you're going to get eaten alive by mosquitoes and black flies. In the winter, you're going to freeze half to death. You're going to have to carry a bunch of stuff as you portage through the forests and travel on the rivers by canoe. And on top of all of that, not all of the indigenous tribes there are friendly to the French. You're going to be in constant danger of being attacked and tortured or kidnapped. Are you sure that this is something you want to do? But the dangers only excited Father Isaac all the more. And he was convinced that God was calling him to go to the new world and to preach Jesus to the people there. And so when he asked his superiors for permission, his request was granted. And only a few months after he was ordained, Father Isaac boarded a ship and took the long journey across the Atlantic Ocean to land in New France. Now, once he landed, Father Isaac and his fellow Jesuit missionaries traveled by canoe to the Wendat and Algonquin settlements. These were tribes that were friendly to the French, who were allies with them, who traded furs with them. And he traveled to these villages with the purpose of sharing the good news of Christianity with these people who had never heard of Jesus. Now, these tribes had a very complex spirituality of their own. It varied from village to village and tribe to tribe. But basically, one thing that they held in common was that they didn't really believe in one God but rather they believed in this kind of world of the spirits. They believed that everything had a spirit. People had spirits, animals had spirit, plants had spirits, even rocks and inanimate objects had spirits. They also believed in a kind of afterlife, not so much the heaven and hell that Christians believed in, but 
the indigenous tribes believed that the world of the afterlife was much like this one. So after the soul of someone who had died would go into the afterlife, he would go on hunting, he would go on marrying people, fighting his enemies, farming, basically doing all the things that humans already do on the earth. And the Wendat and the Algonquin believed that all souls went there, that it wasn't as if you distinguished between a good afterlife where the good souls went and a bad afterlife where the bad souls went. It was all the same. Everyone all went to the same place and continued to be either good or bad in the afterlife. They had no concept of a heaven or a hell because they didn't really, in their spirituality, have a concept of sin. The Wendat and the Algonquin didn't really believe in being guilty of doing wrong things in the eyes of the spirits. For them, any crimes that were done on earth, like murder or theft, were punished by the tribe, but there wasn't a sense that there was some kind of spiritual punishment that they deserved for their crimes, that it was all settled here on this earth. And so because of this ignorance and blindness towards the concept of personal sin, it was easy for them as a culture to get trapped in some really dark and immoral practices. They didn't realize the harm that they were doing to their souls in doing so because they didn't have this concept of sin. And so Father Isaac, when he came to these villages, was shocked by some of the extremely immoral things that were going on. For one, there was a very strong culture of impurity. Premarital sex was common and accepted in their communities. There wasn't a strong emphasis on being faithful to your spouse even once you were married. And so adultery and divorce were very common, were even accepted. It was so widespread, so prevalent, that children in these villages often knew who their mother was, but they weren't always sure who their father was. That was the level of how much impurity was present in the culture. And so the children were raised by the whole village, by the community as one big family because they often didn't know who their biological father was. These tribes were also extremely warlike. They could be very brutal and violent to their enemies. It was a given, an accepted part of the culture that if you captured a slave, you could ritually torture him for hours and hours before finally killing them and sometimes even cannibalizing them. That was an accepted and widespread practice. All the tribes knew about it. All the tribes practiced it. And it was actually a mark of courage for a warrior to be able to endure huge amounts of torture without crying out in pain. And so Father Isaac and his fellow missionaries came to live amongst these people and they knew that they were coming into a completely different culture, a completely different worldview than they were used to in France. And they knew from seeing all of the practices going on in the villages that it would be very hard to preach the gospel of Jesus here in this context. Now, Father Isaac could have come into the villages and done evangelization very badly. He could have waltzed in and started yelling at everyone, stop sinning. You're all going to go to hell for this. Stop torturing your enemies. Stop sleeping around with each other. And they would have just looked at him like he was crazy because they wouldn't understand where he's coming from. They don't even understand the concept of a one true God. But Father Isaac knew that that would get him nowhere. That people wouldn't understand him and they would rightly reject him as some crazy French guy who would come over to try and impress his culture on their own. And so Isaac came at them with a different tactic. He came at them with a tactic of love because he was honestly someone who loved these people with his whole heart. He was sad that they were lost, that they were lost in their sins. They didn't even recognize how guilty they were before God, that they didn't even know of the one true God, but they were lost in these deceptions about this spirit world and this afterlife that was false. And so he worked hard to meet them at their level so that they could understand him and gradually he would lead them closer to God by answering their questions patiently. And so he learned their language. He lived in their village. He ate their food. He studied their culture, their beliefs about the world, and he tried to become friends with them first before telling them about all of the things that they were doing wrong. And they grew to love him. They came to even give him a name in their own language. They called him Undesunk, which means bird of prey. So he got his own native name and they would invite him over for food. 
and he would talk with them about religion. And he would sit by their fires at night, their campfires, and chat with them about their views on the spirit world and engage them in conversation. And when they asked questions, he would then tell them about what he thought about God, about the one true God who had sent his son Jesus to die for sins. That God was not just one spirit among many other spirits of nature, but that there was one great spirit, greater than all others, who had created everything. He explained to them, That when we do wrong things, like abuse God's gift of sexuality, or like when we kill or hurt or torture others, or when we're greedy or selfish or cruel or any of the other sins that we as human beings are so easily tempted by and cave to, he explained to them that this doesn't only have bad earthly consequences, which they understood. They understood the idea of an earthly punishment, like broken families or death or suffering. But he explained to them that it also has consequences in the afterlife. That the wrong things that we do really matter for where we spend eternity after we die. And he told them that hell is real. That people who choose to stay in their lifestyles of sin instead of following Jesus will eventually spend eternity in great suffering without any end, without any chance to escape. And conversely, he told them that those who turn in faith to Jesus, those who turn to worship him as the one true God, who leave behind their sins, who are baptized into his church, those people will get to spend an eternity in a heaven that is way better than any kind of earthly styled afterlife that the indigenous people could imagine. He said heaven is so much better than just kind of a copy of this world where we hunt and fish and give each other in marriage and have children just like we do in this earth. He said, heaven is so much better than we could ever imagine. And he offered that chance for them to turn to Jesus so that they could reach this heavenly destination, just like he was on that path. And the natives, they really listened to him politely and they had lots of questions for him. And he was able to answer all of their questions as he sat around their fires and talked with them about God. One of the most common questions that they asked him were, Well, I don't need to worry about your ideas of heaven and hell because I think that the French will go to heaven or hell because they believe in it. But we, the Wendat, we're not French. And so we'll go to the afterlife of our own ancestors. So, you know, the French will go to French heaven or hell and we'll go to Wendat afterlife. And Isaac had to explain to them, no, God created all people in his image. Whether you're French or Wendat or Algonquin All people are equal to him. All of us are created in his image and we are all offered the same chance at the same afterlife, either heaven or hell. Even if we don't believe in it, we still don't get to invent our own afterlife. We have to play by God's rules, the rules that he has given to all humans equally. Others chimed in and said, well, Father Isaac, hell doesn't actually sound that bad. We have been trained as warriors to show no weakness in torture. That's how we earn honor. So if your hell is full of torture, we could handle it and it would actually bring us honor. And Father Isaac explained to them, no, there's no honor in hell. There's no courage in hell. All that is in hell is endless shame, endless regret for you because you rejected God who just wanted to love you and save you. You, even with all of your training, even with all of your bravery, there's no way you could endure the torments of hell and come out with honor. And so they sat around their fires. They listened to him politely, but most of the natives weren't interested in becoming Christian. Father Isaac had a hard time making converts because they thought that his religion was good for the French, but not good for them. They basically said, Father Isaac, you know, you you tell us interesting stories. You say some interesting things about this great spirit, about Jesus, but we have our own way. We have our own tribal ancestral rituals and rites. We don't need your French religion. And some of the natives were even more hostile than that because they believed that they were there not to help them, but to harm them. And they had good reason for believing this sometimes because some of the French traders who had come before the priests were greedy and cruel. They didn't act like the Christians that they were supposed to be. They treated the natives as less than human, making the Wendat and the Algonquin rightfully distrustful of Europeans. 
Another reason that the priests were distrusted is because often they were unknowingly spreading European illnesses to the villages that they visited. There was a lot of damage caused to indigenous villages and communities because of European sickness brought there, which they had no immunity for. And the priests would take it from village to village, not knowing because they didn't understand scientifically how that worked back then. They didn't know that they were bringing these diseases to the tribes, but the tribes noticed that everywhere these French priests went, they brought with them sickness. And so they thought that there was evil spirits of sickness attached to them. And so many of the tribes wanted to kick the priests out of the village or even attack and kill them. So despite all of these growing threats, constant danger from hostile native warriors, Father Isaac patiently kept going about his work, showing no fear in the face of all of their threats. And eventually his patience paid off. Gradually more and more of the Wendat people were won over by his good answers to their spiritual questions. They saw that he truly loved them and respected them and honored them as equals. And they could see that he obviously loved them. And so many of the natives eventually came to put their faith in Jesus and were baptized by Father Isaac in his missionary travels from village to village. They left behind their old superstitions and beliefs in the spirit world and they turned to follow the one true God. So Father Isaac went around throughout the whole region, building churches, teaching the new converts, continuing to preach about Jesus to any person who was willing to listen to him. Well, one day, Father Isaac was traveling with a group of Wendat warriors from one village to another in order to bring back supplies. And he knew that this was going to be a dangerous trip because the Mohawk, which was a tribe that was enemies with both the Wendat and the French, the Mohawk were at war. And so they knew that they were going through territory that was very dangerous from ambush from Mohawk warriors. But Isaac went along with them. They were going to get supplies. And while they were canoeing, their party was in fact ambushed by a band of Mohawk warriors who came running out of the woods and jumped them by surprise, killing many of them and taking many others as captives. Now, Isaac was able to escape from the battle and hide in some reeds along the riverbank. But when he saw that his Wendat companions were being roped together, and beaten into line in order to be taken back to the Mohawk villages as slaves, or even worse, to be tortured to death, Isaac couldn't leave them behind. He had a chance to stay behind and stay safe, but he refused to abandon his Wendat companions. He wanted to go along with them to encourage them in whatever trials they were going to face. And so Isaac crawled out of the reeds and surrendered himself into the hands of the Mohawk, who took him as a captive with all the rest. Now, when the Mohawks returned triumphantly to their village, celebrating their great victory, Isaac and the other captives were forced to run the gauntlet, which was a form of torture used by the indigenous tribes of Canada back then, in which the whole village would come out and make two lines, and everyone would be holding sticks and rocks and clubs, and they would force the captives to run through the middle of these two lines, and everyone would beat the captives as much as they could, before they made it out the other end. And so Isaac made it through the gauntlet before he was tortured in other ways, including having four of his fingers either bitten off or mangled by the Mohawk village who was torturing him. But instead of choosing to kill him, as they did with some of the other Wendat warriors, the Mohawks decided to keep Isaac as a slave. And so he lived with them for over a year, doing all of the work that only the women in the village would do as a way to cause shame to this French captive that they had. They barely fed him during the winter. They barely clothed him. Honestly, when you read the accounts of what he went through while he was living amongst the Mohawk, it's a miracle that Father Isaac survived that long. Eventually, Isaac was discovered by Dutch traders who had come to the Mohawk village to buy furs from them. And even though these Dutch traders were Protestant, they respected Isaac as a Catholic priest, and they tried to buy him from the Mohawks in order to release him and send him back to Europe. But the Mohawk refused. They wanted to keep Isaac as a slave. And so the Dutch traders secretly organized a plan for Isaac to escape. And in the middle of the night, Father Isaac escaped from the village. 
hid in a barn for a long time until he was able to board a ship and escape back to Europe. And so back in France, Father Isaac was treated as a hero. People were eager to hear his amazing story. He was even invited to meet the Queen of France to tell his story about what it had been like to live in New France and work amongst the native peoples there. The Pope gave him the honorific title of someone being a living martyr, which had never happened before in church history. Father Isaac was treated as a living martyr because of how much he had suffered for the faith while still somehow managing to stay alive. But one of the most heartbreaking things for Father Isaac upon returning to France was that he wasn't allowed to say Mass. Because at the time, there was very strict rules about which fingers priests were allowed to use to hold up the bread during Mass. And Isaac was missing some of those fingers from his time of being tortured by the Mohawk. And yet the Pope stepped in and gave Isaac special permission to say Mass using whatever fingers he had left on his mangled hands, which I think is just so beautiful and the right decision by the Pope in this case to say, look, Father Isaac, you are able to say Mass with those hands that have suffered so much for love of Jesus. Well, you can imagine how easy it would be for Father Isaac to stay in France. This could be the end of the story. That after many years of, of suffering and hard work in Canada, he retired in peace in France. But that's not the style of St. Isaac Jogues. He's not the kind of guy who sits back and says, you know what, I've done my time. I'll leave it to someone else. No, he was eager to return back to North America. In fact, this time his desire was not even to return back to the Wendat or the Algonquin who were friendly to the French. He wanted to go to the Mohawks. He wanted to go as a missionary to those tribes who had tortured and enslaved him. And so after visiting his mother and saying goodbye to her, he quickly got back on a ship and returned to the New World. Now the Mohawks were astonished when Father Isaac returned to their village of his own free will. They knew that he was brave before because of how much he had suffered under them, but this was something they just couldn't imagine. And right away, Father Isaac got to work, setting about his plan to evangelize the Mohawk people and lead them to Jesus. But again, soon after his return to their territory, a terrible sickness broke out among them, probably one that he had brought back with him from Europe without knowing it because he had immunity. And the Mohawk thought that this was a curse from his Christian magic. They thought that he was trying to take revenge on them for their torture and that he had come to their village only to curse them because of how they had tortured him. And so some of the young warriors wanted to take things into their own hands and kill Isaac immediately. But the elders of the Mohawk, who were wiser than some of these hot-headed warriors, tried to protect the priest because they wanted peace with the French. They didn't want to anger the French by killing one of their priests who would come to them of his own free choice. And during this uneasy time, Father Isaac was invited to the longhouse of one of these warriors who he knew was hostile to him. And his Mohawk friends and the elders of the village urged him not to go. They said, Father Isaac, if you go to this house, you'll be outside of our protection. But Isaac, once again, wouldn't back down from a challenge. He thought to himself, what if this warrior wants to hear about God? What if this is my one opportunity to preach Jesus to him? If I don't go, I could miss this chance to befriend him and win him over. And so he went. He went to the house and as he entered through the door, sure enough, the warrior was waiting in ambush and struck him down with a tomahawk, a weapon often used by that tribe, it was like a small axe or hatchet, struck Father Isaac down and killed him. And he was only 39 years old when he died. Now, Father Isaac, during his time amongst the Mohawk, had converted about 60 of them to Christianity. He had planted the first seed of Christianity in that tribe, which would eventually lead to many, many more coming to know Jesus. But the story of Father Isaac doesn't even end here. It gets even better because years later, Algonquin warriors captured a Mohawk man who claimed to be the one who murdered Father Isaac. And the Algonquin warriors were furious at the fact that he was bragging about killing their beloved priest. And so they wanted to kill him. They wanted to put him to death. But the Jesuit priests in that village 
took this Mohawk warrior in for protection. And they told him about the love of God. They told him about the forgiveness that was possible, even for the crime of killing one of God's priests, one of their own brothers. And slowly the man opened up. And he said how even though he had hated Isaac when he lived amongst the Mohawk, hated him enough to want to kill him, he remembered that he had told him the same things about God that these priests were telling him now. And eventually, his heart was moved. And he repented and he, he confessed the fact that he had killed Isaac, but that he wanted to give his life to God. And he was baptized and became a Christian. And the coolest part about this story is that when he was baptized to Christian, he took the name Isaac. St. Isaac Jogues murderer took the name of Isaac when he left behind his sin of murder and became a Christian. Now, one of the things I love about St. Isaac is the fact that throughout his life, there were so many chances for him to take the easy, the safe, the comfortable route. But he always chose to do the right thing, even when it was hard. His love for the indigenous people of North America called him to leave behind the comforts of France. It called him to leave behind the safety of the reeds when he could have saved his own life. It called him to return to his captors who had treated him so cruelly. And in the end, it called him to the house of someone who he knew hated him enough to want him dead. But he didn't ever turn back. He was courageous. He was bold. He had absolute trust in God. He had a toughness and an endurance to take on whatever is necessary to serve. He is a true hero for God. And so let's pray now that we would become saints just like he was. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Isaac Jogues, you showed love and forgiveness towards those who had tortured you and enslaved you. So help us to imitate you in forgiving those who have hurt us especially those who don't deserve forgiveness and win them over with the love of Jesus, just like you were eventually able to win over even your own murderer by your prayers from heaven. You were not afraid to do extremely tough and dangerous things in service of God. So help us to also be courageous to do whatever God asks of us, even if it forces us to risk something to be uncomfortable or to step out in faith. St. Isaac, you patiently answered the many different questions of the indigenous people that you were trying to reach for Jesus. You tried to reach them in a way that they could understand and relate to. So help us too in our own culture, with our own friends, to lovingly meet people where they're at and to gradually lead them to Jesus through our own witness of faith. St. Isaac Jogues, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.